next year there will be a presidential election where a Democrat will be facing Donald Trump and hopefully beating him. Uh, that's an uncontroversial thing to say in the Navarro Media Studio. And we are going to talk today especially about two candidates, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. Uh, the latest YouGov poll shows that Warren is basically flying ahead in the polls. She's on, well, flying ahead's maybe an overstatement, but the momentum is with her. So this is the latest YouGov poll. Warren is on 28%, Biden is on 25%, and Bernie Sanders is on 14%. Is this a surprise to you? Because, I mean, I remember at, at the beginning of the year, everyone was commenting on why Warren isn't being taken seriously. She was, I think, in the single digits, and it was all about Bernie versus Biden. What explains, I suppose, Warren's phenomenal rise in the polls? I mean, I think the simplest answer is that uh, she's proven to be a good campaigner, and I think she's, you know, and she's she's running a she's running a good campaign. Um, I think. Uh, I have a, a somewhat more partisan answer, which is I think the basic arc of the campaign up until the fall has been that, uh, you know, the the anti-Bernie forces broadly defined um, have kind of cycled through a number of different formulas they've tried. Um, and, you know, so there was the attempt to make Beto O'Rourke into a national figure. I think we can say at this point the very unsuccessful attempt. Um, Didn't then, he come back a bit when he started swearing a bit more? I mean, he came so back he was and ju- he sort of tweeted like he's a fucking racist, yeah, and then everyone's yeah. like, "Yeah, better. Maybe he's got character." Yeah, he <laughs> he's he's tried to pivot to making gun control his thing, and um, I mean, I think he's come back in terms of his visibility on Twitter, but but not in the polls, I think. Um, and then after him, you had uh, you had Mayor Pete, yeah, um, who you know was another figure who really, I mean, I think even more than O'Rourke, no one had ever heard of him, and all of a sudden he was all over magazines and things like that. Um, and he did have a brief surge. There was one point where I think he was pretty safely established as kind of the fourth, you know, fourth candidate. Um, but that didn't last long either. Kamala Harris hasn't been doing well. And, you know, Biden has loomed over the whole thing. Um, uh, but I think his, his his lead has kind of been slowly diminishing. There's not a lot of dynamism to his campaign and they're having to sort of keep him out of events and stuff. Um, and actually, in this last quarter, his fundraising numbers were really bad. So it does look like the debate is is shaping up to be, uh, or the contest is uh, shaping up to be one between Sanders and Warren. And I think what Warren's been able to do, and again, I'll qualify this by saying it is a somewhat um, partisan reading because I have pretty strong views about this. Um, I think That's what Warren's allowed. okay, good. Uh, I mean, I, I think I think what Warren's been able to do is, um, you know, she's been able to. Uh, embrace parts of Sanders' agenda and and kind of campaign on them in a way which is more politically palatable to the and more rhetorically palatable palatable to, um, you know, the professional managerial class constituency that I think has been you know dominant in the Democratic Party since the early '90s, um, and to all of the kind of uh, the newspapers and the sort of big outlets of of liberal liberal opinion, um, and I think I think. Um, uh, so I think she's I think her success is in some ways an expression of a contradiction. There's clearly uh, a demand for transformative change, but there's also um, there are a lot of people who are very hesitant about embracing, um, you know, a version of it that I think many people on the U.S. left would find sufficiently radical. And so Warren has actually emerged as a kind of compromise candidate that all these other people sort of tried and failed to be. Does it show I'll posit this to you, actually, does it does it show a victory for the left that Elizabeth Warren is the compromise candidate. I mean, because there's a sort of negative way of looking at it, which is sort of like, you know, Bernie got outflanked by someone who is much less anti-establishment than him, someone who's much less willing to take on the vested interests in the United States. But the fact that she's a compromise candidate, that's pretty... They've done all right, right? I think, like... I think um, if, if Warren had been the candidate in 2016, that would have felt like a massive victory. Um for the left. I mean, I would have been over the moon if she'd have been the candidate in 2016. So yes, I think definitely. But it, I mean, you know, we've just talked a bit earlier about the Brexit Trump thing, how you think, you know, these sort of, is you can't, the things that happen in the US are not necessarily analogous to here, but it does kind of remind me of uh, Ed Miliband becoming leader in the sense that like, um, when, uh, when Gordon Brown stepped down, there was a sense that there needed to be some sort of um, compromise with the left, um, and but the left also recognised that that there needed to be a candidate that was electable, and so you ended up with Ed Miliband, who was like um, a kind of neither left nor right were happy with him because he was either too left wing for some or too right wing for others, 
And I so I think like she sort of reminds me, Warren reminds me of Ed Miliband in that respect, um, in the sense that it's like a candidate that neither the sort of socialist left or the centre are happy with, but both will accept for the other one and both are kind of resentful about because they feel like it, the, the candidate has been imposed on them by the other faction. Um, and I think like she's also reminiscent of Ed Miliband's leadership in the sense that like um, she wants to introduce progressive policies through the traditional structures of Washington, which I think have shown themselves to be you know, through the kind of tinkerings of people like Mitch McConnell have shown themselves to be insufficient for a truly like transformative politics. And I think that will be difficult for her. I think if she wins, if she wins the candidacy, that's like um, great for the left. And I think, um, thank God it won't be Biden, who I think would be absolutely destroyed by Trump. Um, I think she has a shot. Um, I'm also very partisan on this and I don't think that um, she has as good a shot as Bernie mm. at winning the states that she needs to win. And um, I think, you know, her support is very um, college educated, um, sort of urban support. And I just don't, I think those are not the people who are, are needed to win for the next election. She needs to present something that will actually make Democratic voters get off their sofas and go to a polling station and vote. And that was what Hillary Clinton failed to do. Let's go to a clip. Uh, so obviously you've said that the debate, well, I mean, Biden's still not out of the race, but I mean, he does look like a fucking idiot every time he speaks on television. So I, I can't really see him getting the nomination. So it does seem to be like an ideological battle between Warren and Bernie. Bernie obviously now has to try a little bit harder to distinguish himself from the rest of the race it was easy to say how he was different to Hillary Clinton now he's got to make a slightly more nuanced art argument about why people should choose him over Elizabeth Warren he was asked that question I think earlier in the week so we're gonna to go to that clip now so, so let me ask you, you you and Elizabeth Warren have pretty close to identical positions on, 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 on the big issues what, what do you say to those who say that they would pick her because she's eight years younger than you, she didn't just come through this, you know, didn't just have a heart attack, and, and look, in the positions, you're pretty much the same. Well, look, uh, everybody, every American has got to make his or her own choice about the candidate that they want, and Elizabeth Warren has been a friend of mine for some 25 years, and uh, I think she is a very, very good senator. Uh, but there are differences between Elizabeth and myself. Elizabeth, I think, as you know, has said that she is a capitalist through her bones. I'm not. I am, I believe, the only candidate who's going to say to the ruling class of this country, the corporate elite, enough, enough with your greed and with your corruption. We need real change in this country. What did you think about that answer? Do you think he's pitched it correctly? He's saying, you know, what's different about me? Elizabeth Warren is a capitalist at her bones. I'm not. So I saw, I saw, I think, Baskar, who's your publisher, uh, saying on, on, on Twitter that this is theoretically quite a good answer. But to be honest, it's a little bit abstract. I don't think there are that many voters in the United States who say, well, I want to vote for someone who's not a capitalist. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's kind of abstract, right? So he has to explain, this is what Baskar's saying, he has to explain why it's only Bernie Sanders who can give you proper Medicare and who can give you proper, I don't know, a wage increase. Is housing a big issue there? I don't know. I interviewed um, Joshua Green for my book, who is the, Steve Bannon's biographer. Oh, wow. And he said that um, Americans, like... Uh, I think he was quoting from another article or he was either talking about his, his own reporting, but he said that Americans have gone from being angry at, at Wall Street to being angry at the government to being angry at elites in general. And I think like that's something that Steve Bannon understood and felt actually, um, and so was able to sort of project that. And um, I think that he, he sort of helped Trump over the line with that. So I think you're right. I would agree with you that it's not necessarily true to say that uh, American voters are like, I want someone who isn't a capitalist. That doesn't seem plausible to me, but they might want someone who's like, I'm going to take on the elites. Yeah. You know, because a lot of bad shit has gone down in America in the last 10 years and no one has really been held to account for it. So I can, you know, I, I think that's plausible. I mean, Warren also does a version of small p populism, right? Just how, how much does she talk about taking on elites? 
I mean, I think she definitely rhetorically embraces that language, but I think she, I mean, I think she does it a bit less. And I also think that in practice, she, she does it a bit less. Um, I've actually got a, a Twitter thread of here, hers here that I think uh, is pretty illustrative of the differences between her and Sanders. Um, and, and, you know, for a lot of people, um, uh, you know, who are no, who don't, uh, who, who don't uh, agree with what I think is basically the Jacobin uh, pro Bernie uh, consensus around this, um, they look at uh, Sanders program and then they look at Warren's program and they see that there's a lot of overlap and I think for a lot of people the discussion kind of stops there. They think that um, uh, I mean I don't want to put words in people's mouth but it's my sense that a lot of people think that um, it, the distinction between someone who says I'm a capitalist and someone who says I'm a socialist when they have uh, some policy overlap is basically a semantic one particularly for the reasons you said right how many how many voters think idiomatically in those in those terms. Um, but I do think that uh, I do think uh, Sanders and Warren have very different conceptions of power and they have very different political strategies. And that comes out um, in the versions of populism that both of them um, uh, both of them uh, embrace. So Elizabeth Warren uh, has a piece of legislation, uh, a, a, a plan, I should say, called the Accountable Capitalism Act. And it's got lots of good stuff in it. Um, requires workers to elect uh, 40% of, of the board, uh, requires uh, boards and executives uh, to uh, sell stocks, requires 75% of execs and shareholders approval for political expenditures. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, the 40% one's quite big. Uh -huh, I, I think that's, I don't think the Labour Party have even put a number on that high. Yeah, and I think, workers on I think Bernie's just put out um, a, a, a proposal where it's a, where it's a little bit higher but um but i love this uh, arms race it's like we'll give them 40 percent. i'll give them 50 percent. Right, right, you've right, got, right you've got to be careful though with the workers on boards because i don't know about in the u.s where uni union density is um very low mm -hmm. but in this country like workers on boards can sometimes be used by companies to sort of elbow out the union Mm. Um, and so I think that's one thing I prefer to with um, Sanders over Warren is that he has been using his support base to um, gather support for movement. like, yeah. yeah. And he also wants to um, repeal the, I can't remember what the legislation is called. I don't want to say Taft legislation, but I might be wrong about that. I can't remember what it's called. But basically it's like the le the um, American anti-union legislation that doesn't allow things like solidarity strikes. Mm. So for me, that is where he's more mm -hmm. socialist. Sorry, I interrupted you. That's okay. Continue. Well, I mean, so they, but again, they both have, uh, they both have, uh, they're both pitching plans to make it easier to join a union and things like that. Um, but, you know, Bernie is actually using his list to direct supporters to picket lines and things like that. Um, Elizabeth Warren, I don't think has talked as much about the strike wave that's been happening in the United States. Um, so that's that's another distinction. But I just want to talk a bit about here about this this uh, this Twitter thread that Warren did about accountable capitalism, because it starts off pretty good. She says year after year, corporate profits soar for executives and shareholders, but workers wages barely budge. I'm reintroducing my Accountable Capitalism Act to empower workers and help fix this fundamental problem with our economy. So it's not exactly Eugene Debs, but it's pretty good stuff. Now, uh, a few more tweets down this thread. Uh, she says, 181 CEOs signed a biz roundtable non-binding pledge to account for workers and consumers and their decisions. Um, I'm urging companies, she, she lists them off, um, you know, to embrace these reforms. And she says, for most of America's history, when our companies did better, our workers did better, and America built a thriving middle class, the Accountable Capitalism Act will help realign our skewed market incentives so companies and workers can once do again well together. So this is a lot closer to a kind of language of liberal cor corporatism and one that one that's aiming uh, for, you know, a kind of generously a kind of cross class consensus, uh, whereas, you know, Sanders, if if he was pitching, um, I mean, in many in many respects, he's pitching these same proposals, often a little more radical. Um, but but when he talks about them, he says things like if there's going to be a class war in this country, it's time the working class mm. started winning it. And again, a lot of commentators will look at this and they think that this is a real, this is a semantic distinction. And functionally, if they're if they're running on similar agendas, uh, there's no difference. And I uh, I disagree pretty strongly with that. Um, and uh, I mean, the other thing we might talk about, and I think you alluded to it, Michael, is is um, or maybe it was you, Ellie, that the basis of support um, that both of them have at the moment are are so different. Elizabeth Warren, uh, I think, wins in every poll with people who make over a hundred thousand dollars a year. 
Um, you know, Bernie Sanders, I think it's in the single digits, mm-hmm. the number of people who make that much, who've, who've donated to his campaign. And the top three employers, um, by my last count, uh, uh, of people donating to his campaign were, I think, Amazon, Walmart, and Starbucks. Mm-hmm. So these are people who are serving coffee. They're working behind counters. This is, this is the working class. And I think that a transformative policy agenda has a much better chance of succeeding if it's being carried out uh, with, you know, the agency of, of, of those people rather than as part of a, um, uh, something that uh, is, you know, heavily based in the professional managerial class, um, which I think really needs to be, uh, that's a section of the democratic base that really needs to be antagonized if any of this stuff is ever going to have a chance of of, of, of getting of uh, getting through Congress. Is there a chance that the polls are misleading us? So if you, if you think about the fact that Elizabeth Warren's, I mean, we know this, that Elizabeth Warren's support base is more educated, more middle class, uh, more, I suppose they're both urban, but different areas. Um, there was that great map which showed that where each of them were getting their donations mm-hmm. from and Bernie Sanders was getting the most donations in nearly yeah. every part of America apart mm-hmm. from a particular part of yeah. Uh, New York, yeah. which was Warren, yeah. and a particular part of Washington, which was Buttigieg, <laughs> and then I think Klobuchar from whatever her yeah, her, her yeah. state was, Minnesota. Um, yeah. So the question was, if Bernie Sanders' more working class support base means that there might be an electoral shock or an electoral surprise, in the same way that I suppose we were talking about Brexit earlier. One reason why there was a big shock when Brexit won is because they were they're the type of people who are less likely to appear in in opinion polls, mm-hmm. um, but might turn out. On the day, so could we see an upset and Bernie actually wins this one? I mean, I'd like to think so. I mean, I, I do think that there are, um, you know, despite his poll numbers not having moved too much, and despite Warren undeniably, uh, I think surging ahead of uh, both him and Biden. Um, I mean, he has received more individual donations. I mean, he's breaking he's breaking records. Um, and as as you alluded to, there's that map that just showed he's he's strong all over the country. He's getting money from. From everywhere, and I think his his strategy is premised on pretty heavily on bringing people in to vote, um, who've been really who've been disengaged with the political process. I mean, voter turnout in the United States is is terrible, and when you look at the, uh, I wrote a I wrote an essay a few weeks ago about non-voters, um, and you know non-voters don't really fit the kind of caricature of of just apathetic people who are switched off. I mean, they do tilt much lower income, and when you pull them. Um, on why they don't vote, they do say it's because I'm not I'm not represented. Um, there's nothing there's nothing for me to vote for. Um, and I think Sanders' strategy understands that and is very actively engaged in trying to bring lower income uh, people and, and non-voters into the process. And when pollsters uh, do these analyses, I mean, my understanding is um, uh, a lot of their calculations are based on past trends, which demographics have turned up before and things like that. And so I think that Sanders may have support this not being captured in some of these polls. I'd certainly like to think so. I want to go to another clip. So this is a clip that went completely viral, I think, about a week ago. It was Elizabeth Warren in the, I think it was an LGBTQ town hall. There was actually, we, unfortunately, we haven't shown that clip, but there was a Joe Biden moment where he says, there's people in the bathhouses having orgies in San Francisco. <laughs> so, I don't know, it's a very strange thing what? for this Biden old, said that? old whites. It's, uh, did you, do you remember the clip? I confess was, I didn't see this. It must have happened while oh, I was here. I should have put it in the script. I'll, yeah. I'll tweet it after the show. It's yeah. very funny. Uh, in any case, Elizabeth Warren uh, gave this response, which was where many people in Britain sort of, I saw lots of people from the BBC sort of tweeting it saying, God, she's good. Like, yeah, she can win. And I kind of watched it and I wasn't that sure, but I'm interested to see what you both think about it. So can we get that clip of Elizabeth Warren, please? Let's say you're on the campaign trail and you're approached. You have (laughs) Uh (laughs) And And a supporter approaches you and says, Senator, I am old fashioned and my faith teaches me that marriage is between one man and one woman. What is your response? Well, I'm going to assume it's a guy who said that. (laughs) And I'm going to say, then just marry one woman. (laughs) I'm cool with that. (laughs) Assuming you can find one. I kind of thought it was a flop. I mean, it reminded me of Hillary Clinton's deplorables comment because it's sort of just like dismissing a, a vast swathe of the American population, which is a kind of weird thing to do if you're running for for president. Also, the fact that the, the, the questioner did that kind of accent, I thought was a little bit weird. But I do value success. And the fact that it's been viewed 12 million times on YouTube, mainly by people sharing it, you know, saying this was such a great burn. 
has made me think maybe maybe it was a good answer. I don't know. What what do you think, Ellie? Um, I'm scared that I'm gonna get cancelled for saying this. I someone sent it to me being like, This is great and I my nope. first thought was she's gonna lose the election. <laughs> um and the reason that I thought that is because um it's not because I think oh, like I mean obviously I don't think that any politician any, anywhere ever should ever express or pander to in any way homophobic opinions and obviously that that's not what I think um and I also don't think that um you know the voters that uh Trump won over Clinton in like Rust Belt states are like just de facto homophobic because they happen to be were, like blue collar. Like that's also not what I'm saying. I'm just, my my feeling, my anxiety about it is that it just seems a little bit smarty pants. It just seems a bit kind of like, well, I mean, I'm, you know, the fact that I'm saying this is quite astonishing really, but like, it was just like the, the kind of inherent like man hating in it. Like, well, I'm going to assume it's a man that's got that shitty opinion. Mm. Like, like yeah, to be honest, there are a lot of women who don't support gay marriage. Yeah. Also, they? like when when I'm like getting drunk with my female friends, like I'm kind of I'm. You dad- say all sorts of things about homosexuals. Yeah, I mean, we. <laughs> you promised you wouldn't bring that up. <laughs> um, like you know, when I'm getting drunk with my female friends like obviously we will like make a lot of salty comments about men of of course but just like I don't know like I just sort of think if I was like a man living in one of those states and you have this kind of like apparently like wealthy woman um sort of just being a little bit smarty pants about it and then like just dropping in that kind of yeah or just like man hating comment, like it's also just a Harvard law professor saying if you can get a woman, yeah, it's yeah, just a bit it's like, just a bit like who are you appealing to? Like I feel like you're gonna appeal to people who will already vote for you, like who? I mean, you know, like I'm glad that she gave an answer. I I would prefer her to give that answer than to give an answer that was like, well, I respect your homophobic opinion. Mm. But I just, it was just the attitude of it that I, like, it, it reminded me of Hillary Clinton, this idea that, like, this kind of privileged, um, like, wealthy, kind of upper middle class woman is, like, somehow, I don't know, like, um, somehow kind of in some way part of the oppressed mm. and that men are the oppressors. And, and that's what, what, like, is that what we're going to sell? Is that what, like, they're going to sell? Um, um, like, she is going to sell to um, people who live in former coal countries in America? I mean, yeah, it just made me kind of nervous. Luke, what did you think about the clip? And also, are you worried that Elizabeth Warren could do a Hillary Clinton campaign, Mark II? I mean, uh, yeah, I have an alternate, but but I think equally cynical reading of it, which is uh, comes from a, a fairly... Uh, perhaps dubious source, which is the Washington <laughs> that's, Free Beacon. That's kind of source. Yeah, right. um, and uh, the headline here is CNN failed to disclose Warren Town Hall questioner was maxed out donor. Um, so people can people can look that up. Uh, apparently, allegedly, uh, Morgan Cox, the questioner, has uh, has donated a lot to Elizabeth Warren. Um, but I, I think for me, watching the clip again, I mean, it does it does seem a little canned. Um, I mean. Perhaps, uh, perhaps partisanship is clouding my my judgment here, but, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think, I don't think Warren is. I mean, she's. Uh, there are maybe people that want to compare her to Hillary Clinton, and um, I would, I would distance myself from from that. In that, I mean, she's clearly her politics are clearly, you know, significantly to the left of Hillary Clinton's. Um, Hillary Clinton's politics, I think, were often very hard to to nail down. Warren does have particular concerns that she's been very consistent on, at least since she's been in in uh, politics and as long as she's been a Democrat. Um, but which isn't that long. Which isn't that long. It's true. Um, uh, but I mean, yeah, Sanders has been campaigning for for gay rights. Uh, w- was campaigning for gay rights when when Warren was uh, still a still a Republican during the Reagan era. Um, but perhaps that was a little below the belt. But uh, uh, again, a caveat, usual caveats about partisanship clouding my judgment. But I mean, I think there is a sense in which um, a clip like this does have a kind of Hillary Clinton campaign energy to 
to it to me, or, or not the clip itself, but the sort of viral quality of it and how it was received. Um, I think that I'm I'm obviously a lot more comfortable with the um, program that Warren's running on than the one Clinton was running on, which was I think pretty openly contemptuous, not just of the socialist left, but of the of the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. I mean, I think it was very much a, a center right kind of campaign. Um, but I think uh, given how kind of professional and managerial a lot of Warren's uh, most enthusiastic support is. Um, S things like this, um, you know, the, the 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 good things Warren is running on a side. Things like this um, do have a slight vibe of you know another the birth of another sort of middle class personality mm -hmm. cult, right? Getting excited about someone um, who you know because of their credentials, um, you know, this is a. Um, I, I I do think there are a lot of liberals who think, uh, you know, we get a Harvard lawyer in here with with the white papers and the plans and that's how we can fix things kind of by by fiat and by strength of kind of raw intelligence and i think that to say the least is a is not a good analysis of 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 how how change has worked historically or how it could possibly work in america in in 2019 i think she's like got substance and that that differentiate differentiates yeah. her from clinton there was some data that showed that clinton spoke more about herself and less about uh policy than any other candidate for which like those records exist and wow I think, like, that's amazing because it, it was all about i'm the most qualified woman ever to be united states president but she didn't have any policies yeah whereas warren's a, got a plan for yeah. everything which there's Hillary a paper that i will send you the link to if you want to tweet along and put like on the youtube with the show but like it it's, it's sort of that's what it said and the other thing that it mentioned as well actually is as you were saying earlier that bernie's um donations from small donors is actually like unprecedented it was unprecedented in 2016. so i think like you know um clinton's whole like apparently one of the slogans they were thinking of coming up they were thinking of using for clinton before they settled on i'm with her was hashtag it's her turn <laughs> yeah so the clinton's whole campaign was like um coronate me that was that was her that was her message to america i did i deserve this coronate me Whereas Warren has substance, you know, she's she's talk she's making arguments, she has policies, she has ideas, and um, you know, and I think that gives her a better shot than Biden against Trump, and it certainly gives her a much better shot against Clinton. But you know, as you say, it is this kind of like middle class personality cult that makes me really anxious because there are a lot of Americans who feel very excluded by that, who need to vote for this person, um, who didn't vote for Clinton, Democratic voters who didn't vote for Clinton, and they need to feel, they need to feel like it's worth them going and voting for this person.